All right. Hello, everyone. This is Mallory Flowers on behalf of Jennifer Shelton Associates, and we are coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Welcome to our webinar Wednesday series. Our webinars are held every Wednesday in 2018 at 12 p.m. and 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and our speakers range from accountants to attorneys and other industry professionals. The full schedule for the rest of the year is on our website underneath the webinar tab. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, and our speaker's contact info is posted on the last slide. So if you have any questions, please contact the speaker directly. The recordings are also underneath the archive webinar tab on our website and on our YouTube channel. All right, and this is just a quick word about us. Jennifer Shelton Associates is based in downtown Washington, D.C., and we help both product and service companies with federal contracting. Our clients are domestic and foreign defense contractors and civilian, and our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles, including the GSA schedule. We can also help you with proposal writing and post-award contract administration. More information about our services and upcoming events can be found on our website. And here are some upcoming events for the rest of the year. Um, please see more on our website. So we're gonna go ahead and dig in today's presentation, which is the fundamentals of federal bid protest with our speaker, Maria Panicelli. You can learn more about her background on this slide. Thank you, Maria, for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Mallory, and thanks to everyone joining us out there today. Uh, as Mallory said, my name is Maria Panicelli. I am a partner at the firm of Cohen Seglius, and I'm a partner in the federal government contracting group which means that I focus exclusively on all things relating to federal, federal government contracts and advise clients throughout the life cycle of those federal contracts, from the pre-proposal stage, through any protests, um, through performance and compliance counseling, um, and any you know, REAs or claims or other dispute resolution that comes up uh, during performance or thereafter. Um, I also counsel clients with small business procurement and all sorts of issues relating to small business programs. Um, but today what we're going to be focusing on is some of that pre-proposal stage, or I'm sorry, pre-award stage issues, specifically how to deal with federal bid protests and how to successfully assert and defend those bid protests. Next slide, please. So there are several varieties of protests that you should be aware of as a government contractor. Um, the first, which we're going to focus on today, is bid protests. Bid protests uh, arise when a, another contractor, usually a disgruntled competitor, um, raises a challenge to something that the agency did with regard to source selection. In other words, they protest some uh, policy or procedure or some action that the agency took in selecting the awardee for award. In contrast, a size or status protest is also lodged by usually a disgruntled competitor or someone else that was competing for the award who did not get it. Um, but they don't challenge agency action. Size and status protests instead focus on the eligibility of the company. So whereas a bid protest might say that, and as we're gonna talk about as we go forward with the slides, might say something along the lines of, you know, the agency applied unreasonable evaluation criteria or misinterpreted the evaluation criteria set forth in the solicitation, Therefore, the rankings that they gave everybody were off. Therefore, the best value analysis was off. And therefore, the, the person who was ultimately selected for award should not have indeed been the person selected for an award. A size or status protest is instead not going to focus on anything the agency did or anything um, that the agency might have done wrong in applying evaluation criteria or in comparing the offers. Instead, it's going to focus on the fact that the, the protester thinks that the person that received the award, the entity that received the award, is not eligible at all. In other words, if it's a small business set-aside contract, they don't think that entity is actually small. They think that that is an other-than-small entity. Or if it's not just a small set-aside, but it's an 8A or a hub zone or a woman-owned or an SDVOSB, et cetera, set-aside, that for some reason the entity that got the award does not meet the eligibility criteria of those programs for some other reason. Size and status protests, uh, we're gonna touch upon a little bit today, but we're mostly gonna be focused on bid protests for purposes of today's webinar. Next slide, please. So before we kind of dive into um, the various, uh, I guess, nitty gritty of the protest process, 
it's important to get a, a sense of the big picture and kind of what's going on and why protests occur and what law governs and what key considerations you have to keep in mind. Because when you're aware of all of these things, it really helps inform you as to what you're going to need to be considering um, and what other things you need to think about when you're considering whether or not you want to protest. So the first piece is what law governs. Well, probably not a surprise for many of you who are experienced government contractors, the law that governs is the FAR. Uh, the FAR is pretty much the Bible of government contracting. All roads lead to the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And the reason that that matters in terms of protests is the FAR is where you're going to find a lot of the rules and regulations about how, um, you know, what processes and procedures the agency should follow in terms of applying the evaluation criteria, in terms of evaluating the different offerers, et cetera. So a lot of uh, protest arguments are ultimately based on or boiled down to in their simplest form an argument that the agency failed to follow these FAR procedures or sometimes other um, statutes such as FECA, et cetera. But it's always going to, or most of the time, going to boil down to what the FAR says the agency should do in terms of source selection. In addition to the FAR, uh, there are supplemental agency regulations. Um, those can always add to but never contradict the FAR, but many agencies and kind of subsections of agencies have their own regulations like the DFARs or the AFARs or the, you know, the VAR, et cetera. Um, in addition, worth noting, again, we're concentrating on bid protests today, but if you're talking about the realm of size and status protests, also important to keep in mind that the SBA and the VA small business regulations govern, excuse me, govern size and eligibility and therefore are going to come into play when you're talking about size or status protests. When you're talking about other things that you've got to keep in mind, when you are evaluating your possibility of protesting and the likelihood of success, some of the, and also the potential arguments that you, you might have or the potential things that, uh, you know, might form a protestable basis for your protest. Um, some of the things you're going to want to keep in mind are what agency you're dealing with. Now, that has legal and practical concerns. By legal, um, you know, as we just talked about, different agencies have different supplemental regulations. So if you're talking about, uh, you know, one agency, it's important to know what agency you're dealing with, to know what reg regulations apply. As a practical matter, you might also know that some agencies deal with protests more efficiently or that some are likely to give better debriefs or more thorough debriefs, which we're going to talk about as we go forward. Um, so again, just important to kind of know who you're dealing with. Um, other thing that you're going to keep in mind is what type of contract are you dealing with? And by that, I mean, is it a fixed price? Is it a set-aside contract? Is it an IDIQ? Is it a task order? Depending on what type of contract uh, you're dealing with, different rules and regulations are going to apply and certain limitations might apply. For instance, if it's a task order contract, there might be certain limitations on when you can protest, if you can protest at all, um, as opposed to if you're dealing with just a set aside, or I'm sorry, a standalone contract. And then obviously, if you're dealing with a set aside contract, that is when, in addition to all of the bid protest uh, bases, you also have the size and status protest bases. And finally, you're going to want to keep in mind what type of procurement. And by that, I mean, to the extent that you are going after an award or considering uh, going after an award for a certain type of, or I'm sorry, a certain procurement, what section of the FAR was this uh, procurement initiated other? Is it a GSA schedule? Is it a simplified acquisition? Is it a commercial item? Is it a FAR Part 15 sealed bidding? A lot of times dredging, for example, still goes by sealed bidding. Or is it a FAR Part 15 contracting by negotiation uh, type procurement? And the reason that this comes into play, again, is because depending on what type of procurement, the rules and regulations, and therefore the processes and procedures that the agency needs to go through are going to be a little bit different, and kind of the, the way in which the protest process unfolds is going to be a little bit different. Next slide, please. So when do protests come up? Um, they come up in a couple different places, and it's important to keep in mind kind of where they come up so you can understand the key times that you need to be thinking about protest. Generally speaking, when you're talking about procurement, it starts with a solicitation. After there's a solicitation, um, you know, issued, if there's a problem with the solicitation itself, in other words, uh, you know, you have a potential pre-award uh, solicitation-based protest, you think that there's an issue with the solicitation itself, that is when you should protest. You should protest before bids or proposals are due. Um, but let's say there's no problem with the solicitation. Everybody submits their bid or proposal, um, and everything is going forward. 
in a sealed bidding situation, obviously it's going to go straight to award. Um, if there's an award, we're going to get to that in a second. But let's consider for a second if it's a contracting by negotiation type situation, or if it's you know a FAR Part 8, 12, or 13 uh, commercial item simplified acquisition or GSA schedule, and they're using FAR Part 15 procedures, which oftentimes they do. You're going to go into the source selection process, and there's going to be various notices issued at uh, certain times. If the source selection process involves a kind of a two-phase analysis, that competitive range uh, type analysis, you're going to get a notice if you're excluded from the competitive range. That's a notice that triggers certain deadlines. Specifically, that's the notice that triggers a three-day deadline to request a debriefing, and then once you get your debriefing, you can go on to protest. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go forward. Um, if there's no selection of a competitive range, the next time there's going to be a notice uh, given is if the procurement is a small business set aside or a set aside for any of the small business program uh, participants, then there's going to be a notice issued before an award is made that's going to give everybody uh, notice that this award is about to be made. And if there's any size or status protests to be alleged, now's the time to do it. Obviously, that serves as the catalyst. If you're going to try to do a size or status protest, you have a very short deadline of five days. Um, well, let's say you get past that and you actually get to the award stage, either um, you know, going through the source selection process as I just talked about in a FAR Part 15, uh, 8, 12, 13, et cetera, type situation, or if you go straight to the notice of award in a sealed bidding situation. Then you're dealing with post-award uh, protests. And once again, once you get that notice of award, that triggers certain dates for getting a required debriefing. If you get the debriefing, then you can go ahead with the protest. Next slide, please. So just kind of as a wrap up to that slide, important to keep in mind on where you're at in the chronology. Kind of keep in mind what the timeline is, where you're at, and be aware of when those deadlines pop up and when those certain catalyst moments apply. Um, in other words, what notice is going to trigger an obligation? What do you need to be on the lookout for that you know all of a sudden starts the clock ticking that you need to act? Now, with that as kind of a background and with the understanding of the context that we just talked about, I want to dive into using bid protests as an affirmative tool to get the contract you want. In other words, you were competing for a contract, you just got one of the notices that we talked about, and you didn't get the award. Is there anything you can do? Next slide. So why protest? What are some common bases that you think that you, um, you know, have a right to, to go after? And I put this first in terms of pre-award solicitation issues because one of the most cl uh, common mistakes we see clients make is that they see that there's something wrong with the solicitation. You know, an agency puts something up on FIDBizOps and they say, okay, here's what we're going forward with. Here's the solicitation. Here's all the terms of the solicitation. You know, go forth and bid. Be happy, people. Um, and clients think, hmm, something is wrong in the solicitation. This clause shouldn't be here. If these two things are contradictory or there seems to be an error and they wait and they bid and they think that they can wait until the award is made and if it doesn't work out in their favor, then they're gonna be able to cite back and say that there was a problem with the solicitation. That is not the case. Um, as I said briefly before, if you're talking about an issue with the solicitation, that needs to be challenged, that needs to be protested before the, dead, or the deadline to uh, submit your bids or your proposals. Um, and some of the common issues that you see are patent error or unclear or ambiguous terms. And sometimes you'll even see, you know, if you have a question, an opportunity to ask questions, you ask questions of the agency saying, hey, this section of the spec seems to contradict this section of the spec, what's up? Sometimes you'll get a response that just says, bid it as you see it, which obviously isn't helpful. It's, uh, you know, we're not helping you interpret that or we're not helping you reconcile that contradiction. Maybe that's the time that you want to protest and say, hey, these, these terms are contradictory or ambiguous. It's not clear how we're supposed to bid it or what assumptions we're supposed to make based on that. Um, otherwise, improper exclusion of a required provision or inclusion of an inapplicable provision. In other words, you know there's a FAR clause or some other clause that should be in the contract and it's not in the solicitation. You don't want to wait and try to challenge that later. Now is your time to challenge that. If it's unduly restrictive, um, many of you have probably heard of SECA, the Competition and Contracting Act. It says that as a general matter, all government procurements should be open to full and free competition unless they're you know, subject to some exemption or exception. 
Um, so examples of unduly restrictive is when you see that the agency wrote a solicitation in such a way that, you know, one contractor that they have a good relationship with is the only contractor that could possibly bid. Sometimes you'll see it when they give very, very specific specifications for, you know, widgets, for example, and you know that there's only one contractor that can actually deliver on those specs. In other words, they wrote the solicitation so that only one contractor could compete. That's unduly restrictive. Um, or another example that's kind of more common, or at least more common amongst my clients, uh, we had a situation just recently where uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs was seeking someone who had construction experience, but they specifically put in the solicitation that you had to have construction experience building a hospital in California in the last three years. Now, okay, if you want to say that you need to have hospital building experience because that involves you know, some different services than building another type of building, that might be relevant. But why in California? Why only in the last three years? Um, and we were able to argue that that really didn't have a rational relationship to the work that needed to be done. They were just drawing, uh, you know, unreasonable barriers around what type of experience you had to have and that that was unduly restrictive. And we won that argument. Um, other things that you might see in the solicitation that could lead to a pre-award solicitation protest unreasonable evaluation methods or methods that conflict with the FAR or other applicable law. In other words, if the way in which the solicitation says you're going to be evaluated doesn't seem compliant with the law, then this is your time to challenge it. All right, so we talked about pre-award protests that are based on issues with the solicitation. What about pre-award protests that are based not on solicitation, but on exclusion from the competitive range? Next slide. So they often involve the same issues as post-award protests. So we're going to deal with them together. Common post-award protest issues, and again, these are often the same kind of issues that come up in exclusion for com from the competitive range protests. Most of the time, you're going to see them focused on evaluation issues. In other words, the solicitation laid out, you know, maybe section L or section M laid out, you know, here's how we're going to evaluate the offerers. There are four, uh, you know, evaluation factors. One of them is price. All the, the other three factors are as important put together as price is. Factor one is more important than factor two. Factor two is more important than factor three. And then they'll lay out how the, uh, you know, offerers are going to be evaluated on each of those three um, evaluation factors. What you'll often see in protests, both uh, protests challenging someone's exclusion from the competitive range and challenging someone's, uh, you know, I guess the award to another person, is that, you know, some argument that, hey, the agency didn't follow their own evaluation criteria here. Something is inconsistent with how they said it was going to be done. There's, uh, you know, an unspoken evaluation criteria. In other words, they said they were going to count experience, you know, there's a past performance factor, evaluation factor, and they said they were going to count any experience um, from, any construction experience in the last three years, but they actually gave more experience points or higher rankings to people who had experience with the Corps of Engineers as opposed to any other agency. That wasn't in the evaluation. That's something that they just decided. Maybe that's an argument that they used an unstated evaluation criteria or misapplied the evaluation criteria, et cetera. Um, these are generally going to be arguments that talk about the fact that you know the offerer who's protesting uh, their ratings should have been higher, and the awardees uh, ratings should have been lower. You also sometimes see price issues like price reasonableness or price realism, um, but those can be very fact-specific. If you have a question about that, you should uh, you know, talk to a legal expert. Um, the other thing that you might see is inadequate, misleading, or uneven discussions with offerers. If you're in a situation where the agency did select a competitive range, and then open discussions with the people in that competitive range, they are required to treat all of the people in the competitive range, all of the entities competing equally. So if you see a situation where they had discussions with one offerer that gave them a lot more information, gave them a lot more ability to change their proposal for the better, and they really didn't have as informative discussions with the other offerers, that's uneven discussions, that's a basis for protest. And finally, as kind of a, a catch-all or a lot of times um, something that helps you prove the other issues but also is a basis in and of itself, 
insufficient documentation. The agency has a requirement to properly document um, all, all things that happen in all evaluation uh, and all analysis that goes into that evaluation um, when you're talking about a uh, source selection decision. So if they fail to do that, the very fact that there is insufficient documentation is in and of itself enough to uh, sustain a protest in some circumstances. So that's a big one um, because a lot of times what you'll see is, and we're going to talk about debriefings in just a second, but a lot of times what you'll see is that an agency will try to um, kind of obfuscate or say, oh, we don't have any documents. That decision was you know, predicated on discussions of the source selection committee, et cetera. Well, if they don't have a memo or they don't have any documentation to show what those discussions did and how the analysis was performed, then no, I'm sorry, that's not going to be enough. You can't get around that. That's a basis to sustain a protest. Um, next slide, please. So debriefings. Debriefings is a, is a big thing and it's often misunderstood by contractors. Um, the biggest issue is you know, when a debriefing is required and when do you need to request a debriefing. Debriefings are not always required. If you're dealing with a uh, sealed bidding situation or certain times if you're dealing with a FAR Part 8, 12, 13 uh, type of procurement, again, important to know what type of procurement you're dealing with for this reason, um, and they're not using FAR Part 15 procedures, you might not have to request a debriefing. In other words, the, uh, if you just go right ahead after you get that notice of award and you go, well, I didn't get it, all right, I've got to you know, you know, file a protest, you don't have to request a debriefing in order to be able to file a protest. FAR Part 15, you do. In other words, even if you think, I don't need a protest, I have enough information, I know tons of stuff about what they did wrong, Information gathering is not necessary, so I don't need a debriefing. I'm just going to go straight to the protest stage. You cannot do that. Uh, your protest will be dismissed because it is a prerequisite to get a debriefing. So very important to understand if a debriefing is required or not. Now let's assume that it is. When do you need to request one? Remember that chronology that I went through when I talked about the different notices that you need to get? If you get a notice that you are excluded from the competitive range, you have three days to request in writing a debriefing. If you get a notice that someone else was given an award and you did not get the award, you have three days in writing to request a debriefing. I always say the sooner the better, um, do it immediately. Uh, what is the purpose of a debriefing? Debriefing is, I mean, the purpose is somewhat different in, in the eyes of the government as opposed to in the eyes of a contractor. But what I think everyone agrees on is it's an information gathering tool. Um, contractors use them to get information about why they didn't get an award. An important thing to keep in mind here is that a lot of contractors assume they should only get a debriefing if they didn't get the award. We tell our clients that that is not the case. Get one no matter what. If it's a, um, you know, a FAR Part 15 and they're required to give you a debriefing, even if you get the award, I know it sounds counterintuitive, get a debriefing. Um, Figure out, you, I, I guarantee you, even if you got the award, your proposal was not perfect. It was just better than everyone else's. There are things you can learn about what you can do better and you know what you did right and what the agency really liked and what the agency didn't like. You can get useful information to help you improve as a business and help improve your opportunities going forward. So you really want to get a debriefing in all cases. Debriefings are conducted in a couple different ways either by phone, in person, or in writing sometimes. Um, if you're dealing with a post-award DOD debriefing, you now have these enhanced debriefing requirements where you are allowed to ask questions. That is something that you should have a legal expert help you with because the deadlines with that are a little bit tricky and you need to make sure that you're someone who is entitled to that. Um, in terms of who should attend a debriefing, we often say that an attorney should not be present. Um, a lot of our clients, ask, you know, should I have you come with us? Generally speaking, we like to help with the preparation. We like to help with certain questions. Um, but if an attorney is present at the debriefing itself, it often has a chilling effect. Um, the agency is less likely to give up uh, candid information. So we always say, if you can do it without an attorney, you really should err on the side of doing that and then keeping your attorney apprised. Uh, oftentimes, if you ask, the agencies will let you record the debriefing, and then you can always share it with your attorney afterwards if you want. In terms of what is covered, 
And you're not going to get a point-by-point -point breakdown of a comparison between you and the winning offer. What you are going to get is, um, at a minimum, if it's a pre-award debriefing, you're going to get the agency's evaluation of significant elements in your proposal, a summary of the rationale for eliminating you from the competition, and reasonable responses to relevant questions about whether source selection procedures or applicable regulations were followed. If you're talking about a post-award debriefing, uh, you get a little bit more. You get the government's evaluation of the significant weaknesses or deficiencies in your proposal, the overall evaluated cost or price and technical rating, not only of yourself, but of the successful offerer, in other words, the awardee. And you're also going to get the past performance information, in other words, how they rated your past performance information. You are going to be given the overall ranking of offerers if there was any ranking developed, which oftentimes the agencies try to avoid because they don't want to give you that information. Um, a summary of the rationale for award, and once again, reasonable responses to relevant questions. Um, from my point of view, that reasonable responses to relevant questions thing is the most important. Work with an attorney prior to your debriefing to come up with the questions that you want the agency to answer. They are going to what's uh, they are going to be what gives you the most information to go forward with the protest if you decide to go that way. All right, next slide. There are also some other things that you should keep in mind in terms of you know why protest and can you protest. Um, you're always going to want to have this be a business decision. Um, you know, we understand we're lawyers, we advise you as to the law, but you're going to need to make a business decision as to whether the cost is worth the likelihood of success. Uh, not all protests are created equal. Um, times that you can show a clear error on behalf of the source selection committee are obviously much more likely to succeed than protests that are based on the discretion of the source selection committee. Those are not as likely to succeed. They are harder to win. Um, so it's always going to be a question. Talk to your attorney. Um, kind of suss out the likelihood of success, get a budget or an estimated, uh, you know, cost of the protest and then see if it makes sense for you, um, you know, how much this particular contract means to you, how much you're willing to risk or spend to, to go after protesting it. We also get, as a practical matter, um, a lot of questions about, you know, how it's going to affect your relationship with an agency. You're not going to be blackballed for filing a protest, so you don't have to be worried about that. Obviously, if you file a protest on every single uh, project you ever bid for, that's going to be an issue. But as a general matter, protests are expected. They're part of the procurement process. You will not be blackballed just for filing a protest. Next slide, please. Other things to go over with your attorney when you're deciding how to protest or whether you should protest. Um, you need to make sure that you are someone who has standing. In other words, are you what's called an interested party? If not, you're not the right person to file a protest. That's something that you're going to want to talk about with an attorney. You're also going to want to talk about uh, with your attorney where you should file. Do you want to file with the agency? Do you want to file with the uh, General Accountability Office, the GAO? Or do you want to file with the Court of Federal Claims? Um, those are decisions that you should talk about the pros and cons of each forum, the costs of each forum, the, the different benefits and drawbacks of going to each forum. It's going to be a case-by-case -case determination. Uh, personally, we usually go to the GAO unless there are certain issues involved, and then we go to the Court of Federal Claims. We very rarely go to the agency, um, but that's just based on the types of uh, clients uh, and the work that my clients do. It might be different for you. Uh, how do you file? What should you include? Generally speaking, a protest is going to take the form uh, at the agency or GAO level of a letter. Um, you're going to want to include as specifically as possible all of the allocations that you, um, allegations that you think uh, form the basis of your protest, the more specific, the better. If you go the COFC route, COFC, if you're filing the Court of Federal Claims, you have to file a complaint and sometimes an injunctive relief package. When must you file? This is a very tricky question, and it's probably one of the most important questions in government contracting. Again, the answer here is going to depend on what type of procurement, whether you required a debriefing, whether you got that debriefing, whether you asked additional questions, whether you want a stay, in other words, uh, you know, whether you want the contract to be paused and nothing to, to go forward while you litigate the protest or not. So I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a cliffhanger and say, it depends. Um, you're talking, though, as a general matter, deadlines between four and 10 days. So these are very tight deadlines. The best advice I have is when you, as soon as you think that you have an issue that's going to involve debriefing or protesting, get a legal expert involved. Make sure that you understand what deadlines you're under and what uh, obligations you have 
before each deadline and before each kind of important critical period. Next slide, please. All right, so we've talked about how to deal with uh, protests as an affirmative tool. We're going to very quickly just switch and give you a quick primer on what about if you're on the other side? What if you're defending against a bid protest? In other words, you were the lucky award winner. You got a contract award, and now someone else is protesting you. How do you handle that? Next slide. Unfortunately, there's not much you can do avoid getting protested. Um, again, remember, go all the way back to the first slide. We talked about what a bid protest is. It's a challenge to something the agency did, the policies, procedures, or practices that the agency employed in making a source selection committee decision. So you don't have, as an offerer and even as the awardee, much control over what the agency did in selecting you. Um, so there's not much you can do to avoid protests because if the agency messed up or if the agency arguably messed up, there's probably going to be someone that tries to take advantage of that and challenge it to get an award for themselves rather than you getting the award. That being said, there are some common protested um, defenses that you should be aware of that can help you uh, kind of formulate a defense strategy if a protest is lodged. Next slide. The biggest thing to keep in mind is called intervention. And not intervention in the common, uh, you know, Bravo TV show sense of the word, but intervention means that if you are an awardee, you can be involved in the protest. Um, what's going to happen when a protester files a protest is that they're going to file against the agency and the agency's lawyers are going to get involved in defending the source selection decision. But while your interests as an awardee are currently aligned with the interests of the government, in other words, you want to keep your award and the government wants to keep the award uh, you know, process integrity intact and they want their decision to stand, some point in the protest process, you might realize that your interests diverge. The agency wants to back down and say, okay, we'll reconsider. And you don't want that. So it's very important if there's a protest filed that you, uh, you know, get in involved yourself. If your interests continue to be aligned with that of the government, great. You can sit back and let the government attorneys do a lot of the work and just monitor what's going on. Or you can cooperate with government attorneys and figure out who's going to write what part of the brief, uh, defending the, you know, the award, et cetera. But the first step is always that you want to intervene, make sure that you have your foot in the door, make sure that you're being kept in the loop, and then you can decide from there how active or inactive to be in the protest. But this is going to allow you to keep protecting your own interests. Next slide. Other things to keep in mind, the common procedural ways to fight a protest. Like I said, as the awardee, it's going to be hard for you to try to justify the agency's conduct because didn't have anything to do with you. You were the recipient of the award, so whatever they did ultimately benefited you, but you didn't have control over what they did. You're not going to really be able to, to lend any in interesting information to the defense against a bid protest in terms of defending their behavior or their decision. What you can do, though, is research or talk to a legal expert about these procedural ways to fight a protest. Remember I talked about that standing issue, whether you're a quote-unquote interested party only certain people can file bid protests. So maybe this protester wasn't one of those people. Maybe you want to do some research on whether or not they have standing. If they don't, you don't have to reach the substance of the allegations in the protest. They get thrown out. That's it. Protest dismissed. Similarly, depending on if you're going to the Court of Federal Claims or in some limited cases, uh, GAO, there might be something called jurisdiction arguments. In other words, the, the um, adjudicative body, whether it's the court or the GAO, doesn't have the power, they're not vested with the power under the regulations and under the law to hear this type of protest. Even if the, the protester made a good point, sorry, you're out, dismissed. And follow, uh, finally, especially in COFSI, the Court of Federal Claims, challenges to injunctive relief. Um, a lot of times you can kind of take the wind out of a protester's sails by having them lose on the injunctive relief portion. A lot of times protests become a lot less likely or a lot less likely to win um, and therefore a lot less valuable to uh, protesters if they no longer have the ability to stay the award. So that's another common tool that you can use to try to procedurally fight a protest. Next slide. So I think that's it. I know we covered a lot today and protests can be a very difficult and uh, you know fact intensive process. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. My phone number and email are up on the screen. 
Um, love to hear from you. Love to answer any questions you have about asserting or defending bid process. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And Mallory, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Maria. And that was a lot of great information. Um, and thank you for sharing your time with us today. And thank you for everybody who joined us. If you have any questions for Maria, like she said, please contact her directly with the information you see on your screen. Next week, we are covering preparing for small business graduation at 12. And at 12.30, we are covering category management. So this concludes our webinar. And I thank you again for everybody who joined us.